Okay, welcome Sabbath School members. Let's go ahead and get started. I wonder, um, Dick, would you mind opening our Sabbath School with prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together for worship of you on Sabbath. We're thankful that uh, you have promised the presence of your Holy Spirit to us, and we pray that that same Spirit would dwell with us today, especially guide Harry in his, in his teaching of our Amen. lesson and all of us in our, our thoughts and comments. We pray that our worship this morning here in this Sabbath school will be acceptable to you and that it would be meaningful and rewarding for all of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I'd like to spend some time, start out spending some time with the um, passage in Matthew 4, you know, about Jesus and the temptations. You know, thinking about this story, that's in for any of you that want to look it up again, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. <clears throat> what happened just before this in Matthew? You remember? Yep, remember he was baptized, yep. and God put his stamp of approval, the Holy Spirit did, yep. kind of on him like that, you know. We, we, let me ask you this, would, would a great honor, I mean, this was a great honor, really, oh, yes. you know, from God, would that make it less likely for a person to be tempted? Well, the, well, the first temptation that it says is actually questioning what God had just said. Yeah, yeah. Right? He said, oh. God said, God said, you are, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he said, if you are the son of God, if that's true, then do this. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that was after 40 days. Okay. That's, he, that. So he was a little weaker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but, he, but, but he did have the father's approval. I mean, yeah. heard his voice, knew that he was on the right track. You know, something I, I just thought of, you know, th this last week, you think about it, how, ma how many people today, a after they just received this great honor from God or had been honored in such a way, prob if they'd have been Christ, they'd, they'd have traveled immediately to Jerusalem to cash in on the, on the publicity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Have you ever, ever, yeah. th ever thought about that? I mean... Why did he go? What was his purpose in going to the wilderness? I don't know if it says for sure, but it says, you remember? I think it does say in one place. Don't, don't you think it was to be alone with God? Yeah, well, he was led by the Spirit. Yeah, led, led by, the, by Spirit. the Spirit. Yeah. Be along well, with God. It, 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 let me just kind of put a wrinkle in that. First one, it says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Didn't say to be alone with God. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not saying that wasn't part of it, but I think the main purpose in this was he went out there to be alone to fight the battle that he knows that all of us are going to have to fight. Be, well, we don't. We won't fight it. He'll fight it for us. Well, but we're right. all going to go through Tempted. a temptation yeah. of the devil. Right. And it says that he was tempted in all ways, the same as we are. Right? Yeah. Th this is one of those times, if not one of the greatest times, where he suffered physically. Yes. Um, way before the cross, but in. Yes. But this was when, before he opened his ministry, and in this. A big part of his ministry was relieving the suffering of others. That's right. He had he was gaining victory over Satan and gaining a lot of empathy for suffering man in this. Yeah. And, and 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 when you think about it, if he had been in any way uh, tempted more than we are, or less, or or less. I mean, yeah, if we are, I meant to say, if we are in any way tempted more or or uh, more than he was. It, it it wouldn't have it wouldn't have wouldn't have passed. Yeah. Well, I, I heard a preacher one time, and I think he's right on this. We can know that Jesus was tempted greater than any human. Yes. Because every human has failed, and the temptation has ended. Uh, yeah. He never failed, so the temptation was pushed and pushed yeah. and pushed harder than any of us ever would have experienced. 
Yeah. Because he didn't fall to that temptation. Didn't fall. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. point. That's a good point. Um, you know something? Have you ever have you ever thought that that those who don't really spend time by themselves with God, studying and thinking and asking God's help, really by themselves, I'm saying sol solitary worship, really are not fit to share with others. Have you ever thought about that? If a, if a if a if a person who's a teacher or a pastor, yeah. especially, yeah. does not spend does not have a single prayer life, you know, a personal prayer life, you know, a personal study life, where they wrestle with these things in the Scripture and ask the Holy Spirit to come and be with them and to help them, yeah. are they really fit to share the message with others? I don't know how they can be, Harry. I, I don't I don't know how they could be. Yeah. Um, I, mean, well, I, I you, guess, I guess is, is it really being fit or is it, do they really have a message to share? You know, it, the message is really what Jesus did for you. Yeah, it, yeah, it must be lived, right? Well, well don't you, you don't, how do you know what he did for you if you don't recognize it? And if you're not spending time with him, how are you going to know what that how is? How are you going to find that, right? Yeah. 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 It's superficial. People have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But True but code. when they talk about that, they talk about themselves and not him. Yeah. <coughs> that, that's Often. the devil. Yeah. That, that's yeah. just it. They have a lot, and it, it, it looks like it points it to. It looks like they're pointing to Jesus. Yeah. But yeah. It's really the different path that's pointing downward, but but it it's got the glory, and it looks like it's pointing there. Yeah. But well, it isn't. So. Yeah, that's, that's that deception there where on the outward it looks that way, but there's no depth to it. Well, listen, you know, I, I really, let me take this, I really appreciate you guys' comments, you know, during the Sabbath school lesson. Um, and, and it doesn't matter so much if you disagree with me. Yeah. Because some of those, I spend all the time in between sometimes wrestling with some of those and, and asking God to help me to think about those. And to, and to know what to say, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, so I I think the growing experience should be on both sides, both ends, you know. Yeah, and it seems to me, Harry, you know, that your question, you know, if you don't if you don't spend time alone with God, prayer and study, you know, that I I know for myself, you know, to 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 sit or to stand before God's people is. Uh, uh, Pretty serious calling, and and to be called to teach yeah. is is pretty serious calling. Sure, because I mean, you know, you think about it. If if one of you guys says something that I don't agree with, maybe, um, to me that's a turning point. It, yeah, I I have to decide which way I'm going to go. It's yeah, are like, you it, right or are they right? That's right. Is, yeah. is 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 this a? I mean, this could be a fork in the path. You know. Yes. You have you have to think. Yeah. Of, uh, to me, you have to think about it that way. Yeah. You know? Other, otherwise. I think that you, that you run the risk of getting old and stale. Yes. If you're always just going down one yeah. direction all the time. Yeah. yeah. I, I just noticed something looking at this in, Ma <clears throat> in Matthew. And, you know, the first two temptations start with, if you are the son of God, do this. If, yeah. yeah. Then the third temptation, it's almost like the supposition comes in, well, you must not be the son of God because you didn't do these things. Mm -hmm. So he said, basically... Now, if you do this, I will give you, if you worship me, I will give you these things. Mm -hmm. The things that God said he would give to his son, the devil's now basically saying, you must not be his son, but I'll give them to you. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, because mm -hmm. he didn't say in the third one, if you are the son of God. Um, he said, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. That's insinuating he's not the son of God. He doesn't have that inheritance. And... He, 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 you know, um, that he'll have to get him another way. Well, Robert, I'll take that a step farther. If you read in Ellen G. White, um, she intimates, I don't think she outright says it, but she intimates that Satan was saying he was the son of God at that point. You know what I mean? Like he was the glorious angel. He oh, was, oh, you mean Satan was, not Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Satan right, was right, saying right, he was right. the son of God at that point, and he was trying to act like it was his gift. And, uh, that goes along with that. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about that. Um, <clears throat> so, but think about, did you think about this? Um, why specifically, or more specifically than what's it? I mean, not just because Christ didn't want to sin, but <clears throat> what category of sin would it have been for him to turn the stones into bread? I mean, and you might, there's several answers maybe. It could have been presumptive, <laughs> right? I, I presume that the Father will do this, right? Or, or, that, or that I can do this. Or that, or that God would not take care of me? That's the one that yeah. the, the devil uses on all of us. It's doubt. Yeah. Doubt, that's a good one? Yeah. What about, what about selfishness? That's one of the first things I thought oh, of. Oh, yeah. That goes more with the presumptive thing, like yeah. what, what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, and imagine. <clears throat> I'm thinking to myself, you know. Uh, yeah, all of us, Harry, and and think about, uh, think about being tempted like this, when you're, <laughs> after 40 days. Yeah. You know, 40 days without without food. You know. Yeah, I tell you, you know, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but. If I was being tormented too much physically, I don't know if I could hold out very long. <laughs> well, God knows, and he'll take care of that for you. God, God right. knows, but let me tell you, I've, I've had several nerve conduction tests. I don't know if you've ever had those before. Yeah. And let me tell you, when, when that doctor turns up the juice on that nerve conduction <laughs> test, I, I tell you what, there's, it wouldn't be too long, and I'd be telling everything I knew. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Why did, and think about this, why didn't Jesus argue or debate with Satan? You remember with Nicodemus, how he kind of had a little back and forth, you know? Yeah. How come he didn't do that? How come he didn't do that with Satan? It would add validity to Satan's argument to respond in that way. When you argue with someone, in a way, you're, you're, you're adding, you're almost saying, you might be right, but here's my point. You see what I'm saying? Well, yeah. He took it back to God's word, right? He, he quoted from Deuteronomy, and he said, this is God's word. That was his answer, and he was relying on his father, not resting in his own power, his own argument. Yeah, that, the, well, that's that, another that, good point. That, that's yeah. true, because it kind of goes back to the same thing. If you, if you go back to your own understanding, it's no different than if you're feeding yourselves with the bread from the rocks, right? And it's interesting, too, that he, what he said when he tempted them with, on that last temptation, get thee hence. He ordered him, get away, for it is written, right? It is written. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, serve the Lord thy God only, right? You know. Worship and, the Lord thy God. And to me, it, it's, it's more of a humble kind of attitude, too. Yes. You know, you think, you think about it, it's, it's not like, well, you know, I'm saying this or... Like, you know, where'd you get that from? You know, all, all this kind of stuff. Or I'm, he's relying on himself, you know, kind of thing. But he, in other words, he's relying on Scripture. He's relying on God, not himself. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Jesus, if you think about it, was one of the humblest of all people. You know, I know they said Moses was the humblest man, but Jesus was nothing if not humble. Yeah. And I, I think of humility as the first facet of Christian love. To yeah. me, it's, it's the foundation. There is no true Christian love without humility. That's good. I don't Gary. think. You know. well, that is so true. I, I think also maybe in this, you pointed out, he told him basically the end to get away. Well, he's, yeah. all, he's saying, go Satan. Yeah. That is the first time that he basically says, I know who you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because he came as an angel of light, we believe. Yeah. He was mimicking as though he was sent from God. So in the first two, why would you argue if he appeared to have come from God? Yeah. Is this an argument or is it a dialogue? You see mm, what I'm saying? Mm, They're both, mm. in a sense, saying this is the scripture because Satan said um, basically, you know, um, he first said, command these stones to be bread. But then um, he's quoting scripture basically saying he will command his angels concerning you and their hands will bear you up he will not strike so they're in a way in those first two they're, they're having a back and forth dialogue over is over what might be what god said you know satan's saying god said this but he's 
misconstruing it and taking it out of context. Jesus is putting it back into the right context yeah. through Scripture. But then in the last one, he goes, okay, I know who you are now. Yeah. You are yeah. Satan, and get away from me. Yeah. And at that point, it's over. Yeah. At that point, there, he, you know, there was no point in having an argument before he knew for sure he was Satan, right? He, it was, it he was just, him. he was standing up for what was true. Yeah. You know, as <laughs> about as close to the devil on earth a representative as you'd want to get is, you know, Aleister Crowley. And that came up last, you know, last time I was here. Yeah. And, you know, they were, it was saying, like, one of his mottos was, do as thou wilt. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that came from the Hellfire Club. I don't know if you ever heard of that, you know, back way back in the 1700s, with, of which um, Benjamin Franklin was supposedly a member. Is it? So? It, it was in England, yeah. you know, this Hellfire Club. Do as thou wilt. You, you think about that. I mean, that is exactly what Satan was, was offering to Eve. You will know the difference between good and e your eyes will be open. You will be as God. You will know the difference between good and evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, who is God and do as thou wilt? It's me. Mm -hmm. I am God. I am the God of my own domain. You know, kind of thing. Well, and a clue to how this dialogue came is the very last verse. When the devil left him, angels came and ministered to him. Yeah, Jesus I, was expecting God to send help. I have thought. Right? Yeah. Satan came in right before impersonating that help that he was expecting yeah 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 right yeah yeah uh this it, is similar we uh, watch that thing on the days of noah noah went in the boat yeah god closed the door yeah the rain didn't start for seven days mm -hmm. there was an expectation and a time of trial there that um noah's like what's going on here you know and and, and it was a, a difficult time because outside the boat he was hearing all the sneers jeers and uh, you imagine. know they're probably throwing rocks whatever yeah, yeah, you know um yeah. but he still believed and like mm -hmm. this jesus believed i mean um yeah god allows right before the final deliverance a final trial yeah and um and part of that is when we, like Job, like Noah, like Jesus, when that final trial comes and we believe him, then when he does deliver, deliver yeah. then that deliverance is not only sweeter for that person, oh, but that deliverance is proven to be right and mm -hmm. just. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. You know, I, maybe you've thought like I have. Maybe you've thought, what if I was one of those angels waiting to feed him? Boy, I bet they were chomping at the bit. I bet they just couldn't wait for that final, you know, that dismissal of, of Satan so that they could take him and give him relief, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I'm sure they wanted to jump in when he started talking and shut oh, him up. Oh, I imagine, I imagine, yeah. You, you know, at, at, at this point in world history, do you think that there was any truth that would have been redemptive for Satan that Jesus could have presented? I doubt it. I doubt, yeah, uh, I doubt, his I doubt mind it. was made up when he left heaven. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Satan had already Be made up his mind to reject God's drawing of him to God. Yeah. And, so and that's another reason I don't. Th I think that Jesus didn't treat him like Nicodemus. Right. With Nicodemus, there was a chance, you know. Right. I mean, but with Satan, you know. Yeah, I think Genesis three fifteen was the um, the verse that nails that controversy as as closed. Yeah. Why, why does it describe truth as sharper than a two-edged sword in the Bible? What, is it, what does that mean? Well, a a two-edged sword was one that, like a dagger that was made for piercing, not for chopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, of course, that piercing, where the, the, um, in battle, there's one, one aim. And that's the heart mm -hmm. because that is, you know, a stab to any other place would be agonizing, but not deadly. Necessarily. It, it wouldn't be immediately fatal. It right. would, it would leave somebody wounded, but not, uh, 
not dying immediately. A, a, a pierce to the heart, you don't live long. Yeah, so I mean, this imagery I don't think should be taken as like some kind of fight or some kind of literal duel yeah. you know, or something like that, yeah. but more in the sense of truth separates yeah. a sinner. Mm-hmm. In, in the best case, truth can separate a sinner from his, from his or her sin. Mm-hmm. And put them on the right road. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's why I think, yeah, the cut, you know, yeah, the cut, cut, cut him away. Yeah, cut both ways. Mm-hmm. Cuts cuts away cuts away the error, and opens up the truth. That's kind of the way I've looked at it. You know, um, something else I was thinking. I, I was thinking that another reason that Jesus quoted scripture was to be a witness to the universe. Amen. You know? Yeah. You think about it. I mean, we, so often we just think about what's happening, you know, here in relationship to us. Mm-hmm. But also, I mean, the universe was looking on. Other worlds. That's right. Yeah. Well, and Hope Sabbath School, they talked about this last night. Also, him quoting scripture gave validity to the scripture. Yes. Because when he became the fulfillment for it, he made everything in it alive and true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> something, something else here. Why did, what do you think you shall not tempt the Lord your God or put God to a test? What, what, what was meant by that, do you think? Some of these aren't don't, easy. Huh? No, yeah, I, I, th- I think don't try to use him. <laughs> you know, don't, don't think you can use God. Yeah. Maybe um, don't test God to provide miracles that he has already provided overwhelming evidence for? Ah, oh, good one, Harry. Yeah. What's the point, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like trying to make somebody jump, jump through a hoop, you know. And Who does it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, right. You know, I had, I, I had a conversation, well, I had an email conversation some years ago with a atheist on the internet <clears throat> and he told me that he, w- he was looking for a license plate as he drove into work in Chicago every morning um, that, that was the number pi and he felt like if, that, if he could see that, that and he said he prayed to God about that and he said if you want me to believe in you then show me this license plate <laughs> what, what do you think about that? <laughs> I think he's looking for pie in the sky. <laughs> you know, but I'll, t- I'll tell you this. I, I told him, and I didn't mean to hurt his feelings, but I, I told him, I said, you know, I think there are a lot of other things that are much better evidence for the, for the you know, existence of God than something like this because, to me, this is kind of just like a magic trick. Yeah. And he wrote, he wrote back to me. He was so upset. Really? <laughs> yeah. That, that I would... That I would this was a personal thing, you know, and on yeah. and on, you know. Yeah. So I, I just let it go, you know. There's no sense in yeah. pursuing it, you know. Yeah. But I, what I was hoping he would say, well, what's what? What do you think is better evidence? You yes. Know? Yeah. Well, that's what you had hoped for by that's that. That's what reason. I'd hoped yeah, for, but it, it, yeah. it sure didn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and part of this is on that one about testing God he said if you are the son of God then do this yeah that would say do you believe what God said is true or do you doubt it in other words you need to prove it well if you believe what God said you don't need to prove it yeah exactly and, 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 of course, did Satan know who he was? Absolutely. Of course he knew who he was. He so this, this was him. about questioning what God said at yeah. the baptism yes. and whether or not he believed what God said was true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and that, that yeah. was the test. It wasn't about throwing himself down. Mm-hmm. It was the test of do you believe when God said that you are my son in whom I well pleased, do you believe that to be true? Test that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and mm, that would be. Um, it, I think it, most atheists believe in God. They just have a warped perception of God. They're just not afraid enough. 
just have a warped perception. Well, no, no, you're, e everybody does that yeah, doesn't I've love him, right? Yeah, but it, I, I think people that are professed atheists just, they really believe that there's a God and that they just have this very warped perceptive of, perception of him and they don't want to admit to it. So they've just gone so far away from it hmm. and they can't find their way back. Well, I mean, if, if you'd grown up in the, going to Catholic Church, I mean, you know, I thought about that later. I mean, I could understand why, why he was saying that. Mm -hmm. Because isn't that kind of goes along with what uh, some Catholics at least believe? Mm -hmm. I would think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, Satan in everything, of course, the way his lives work, his purpose for everyone is to cast doubt on God. Because if it was blatant enough to where if he came out and said, don't believe a word he said, he's not true, he didn't do this, he, people would say, no, 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 it's not that black and white. When he comes in, he goes, do you think it might be possible that, uh, you know, whatever, eat with Eve, uh, maybe God's holding something back from you, you know, look at me, you know. Um, it's not that big a deal. Who knows? You know, it, it is planting a seed of doubt, no matter how small it is. And that's the purpose in this with Jesus. Yeah. In all temptation, and you plant a seed of doubt. And if we allow that seed to grow, then the lie becomes truth to us. Yeah. And, and doesn't that prove too, Rob, that we, we, we need to water the truth. You know, we need we need to keep that alive, don't we? Well, and right? that's the word that Jesus was quoting that's, back. That's exactly right. Well, yeah. you know, especially when you say water the truth, I, I mean, I think we need to be convinced in our own minds that's what I'm guessing that it's I'm the truth, at. not just throw it out there as truth because right. you think it's something you read, or, you yeah. know, or, or yeah. I mean, you think about it. I mean, a lot of what people say from the Bible is interpretation. Yeah, Isn't it? And, yeah, and, and then too, Harry, when you think about this, the 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 uh, the evidence that you believe that it's the truth, yeah, is is how you live. You know, I'm right. right. Huh? Isn't it? Exactly right. Tim, and that's what Christ that's, did at the end, right? He knew he was within the will of his Father. Right. He wasn't telling Satan to leave on his own account. Yeah. He was telling him to leave on God's account. Amen. Amen. Yeah. You know, there was a good friend of mine some years ago over at Cascade Road, you know, when that church was still going, and uh, I'd be either teaching or be in the class with him, and, and when he wanted to make a real point, a real solemn point, he would quote Alan White, but he would, but he would preface his remarks with, if you believe the prophet, <laughs> then he would read the, the quote, you know, <laughs> and I, 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 I talked to him, you know, I tried to talk to him because I, I said, you know, Steve, I mean, you know, you, it's still your interpretation of what she means, you know. You have to be careful, you know, when you say that because, I mean, what you're setting, you're setting yourself up kind of like the Pope, you know, making pronouncements like, well, anyway, that's, yeah. The, you know, another point about this thing about Christ quoting scripture, I mean, did he have a, a copy of the scriptures with him when he was quoting? Yeah. So, I mean, what does that tell us, you know? How important is it for us to have scripture in our minds and not just in the book? Yeah. Because, I mean, we're not always in a place where we can have a Bible. Yeah. Something that amazed me. You know, I, I stopped by because I always wanted to. I stopped by and I, I visited Jewish Union Theological Seminary up there in Cincinnati when I was going by at one time. And I went into the bookstore just to see what interesting books they might have, you know. And I, I started talking with this rabbinical student there. He was a very interesting fellow. But, you know, one of the things he told me always stuck with me. He said they had an elderly professor who had the whole... Babylonian Talmud, you know, that's a kind of a biblical expansion on the scripture. I wouldn't, uh, it's not a literal commentary or anything like that. It's, it's somebody's, you know, expansion uh, of 
scripture anyway, based very loosely on scripture, more on tradition, you know. But the Babylonian Talmud is 18 folio volumes. And this professor had the whole thing memorized. He said, as a matter of fact, the st he said the students in class, what they like to do was they like to read part of it and then have him give what came before it and what came after it. I mean, in the time of Christ, I believe that the, there were rabbis and scholars that had committed much of at least the Pentateuch, if not more, of the Scripture to memory. So for Christ to have committed a lot of Scripture to memory would, would, not, would be very believable to me. You know. Well, you know, um, this last temptation where he says that... Uh, basically showed him all the kings and so the world said i'll give all these to you if you fall down and worship me well i believe he would have but in doing that he would have made jesus second in command right because he'd been worshiping him but it goes to show satan does not care anything about the people of this world this is between him and jesus yes. and now that jesus beat him on the cross he's taking and taking this last temptation reversing it He's saying, I will take from you everything I can yes. before the end comes. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. He, he wants his family, doesn't he? Oh, he, Satan doesn't care about us. He doesn't care about that. He no. wants to take from Jesus everything that he can, that Jesus rightfully won on the cross. Yeah. And yeah. That, through, through, through his lies and through the people giving up on him. Yeah. Yeah, you know, well, anyway, let's go over to Monday's lesson, and I want to look at um, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19, just a little bit. You know, it says, For the Lord your God is God, God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Now, the lesson points out that there are multiple New Testament texts that state that God shows no favoritism. Is this true? Well, since we're all evil sinners, that uh, we have nothing to offer him. But on the other side, he loves us all absolutely perfectly. Mm -hmm. Did he die for just one nation? No. Yeah. For one one person? No. no. The sins of the world. He died for the world. Yes. You know, so that he may save the world. And so, no, he's not partial. He's very impartial. He what? makes it available to everybody, but our choice. Yes, I mean, so God may help some people more, but, but why is that? Because they ask for it. They ask for it, yeah. so it allows him to, right? Yeah. right? yeah. Okay, now think about this. Um, what kind of law is always applied with partiality? The law of love. Is that what you're no, getting no. at? No. I'm talking about partiality. That's what, what kind of law is always applied with partiality? But isn't, isn't it human law? Mm. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Yes. Uh -huh. Human law, you know, imposed law, you might say, you know, that's imposed on us, is always applied with partiality, mm. you know? Mm. But what about divine law? It is impartial. It is it is impartial, is it? Yeah, and it why applies, is that? Yeah, across the board, the same, right? Yeah, yeah. But, and and so it's, it's it's that way because agape love doesn't expect a response. Well, right. What I was what I was going to get at. There's Human no law says basically you can earn whatever your way out, your relief from punishment or relief from the law through your wealth, your influence, or whatever. Yeah. You can't earn salvation. He gives it as a free gift and it's given impartially to all. And there are no strings attached. He doesn't have an expectation of giving it. He hopes we will, but he doesn't require anything of us other than to accept it. Oh, one, I was going to say the one thing that I agree with what's being said but the one thing that that is a little bit of a challenge with this this thought of 
no impartiality is is that there are through 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 history and even today swaths of people that that don't literally know the name of Jesus, right? And so you know how God deals with with those people who who are otherwise maybe moral upstanding citizens. You know how God will end up dealing with those kind of people. It's not to me, not black and white. You know, it's like I presume that there's going to be some people that are saved that maybe don't know the name of Jesus, but but that's going to be for God to sort out how He actually does that. You know, so so I I think you know, in one sense, it's simple to say you know God does not show partiality, but on the other hand, you know how that's actually manifest. Well, I think Paul addressed that when he talked about, I see you have a statue to the unknown God. Right. Yeah. Right. In other words, God reveals himself in nature everywhere. They don't know his name, right. but they know his existence. Right. So they're, right. they're doing what, the best they can with what they've got. Exactly. Kind of could, could we say that God is partial to those who know and love and trust him? Is that possible to say that? I mean, well, what do you guys think? He doesn't (laughs) offer the gift any differently. That's correct. Um, So in that, I'd say absolutely not. And he's not partial when it comes to giving out a spirit. Jesus says that you you receive not because you ask not. not. Mm -hmm. That's not partiality. That's yeah. um, your choice. There is no here. The problem is we put bring out of this equation until this is over. There is an accuser in Satan yeah. that stands in the way mm. of us receiving God's blessings if we don't ask for them. Mm. Mm. Um, we we see that with Daniel and how. When he asked for help, it took, what was it, 30 days or whatever. And he says when he got there that he was held up in an argument, basically with Satan. Yeah. And Daniel's prayers were able to um, be a part of breaking that argument. Okay. Oh, in the back. I couldn't quite hear that. What did she, she, she was asking, how do you deal with the ifs in the Bible and the conditions on obedience when it comes yeah, to what he does? Well, I, well I, I think I... Maybe that's kind of what I was talking about here, that those ifs are the, um, the boundaries to where we have an accuser that if, uh, if we allow that accuser to be the influence in our lives, then, then he stands in the way of God's bless, you know, being able to intervene. Um, but for everyone, God's offering the same when it comes to his, his salvation and his blessings. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that there's going to be a lot of different levels of truth that people bring to heaven with them. People are going to bring, a, a, there are going to be some people that, are, uh, that have very little of knowledge of God, and there are going to be some people that have more knowledge of God. But heaven is a place where God's going to bring us all up to speed. Amen. You know? Yeah. And... The main, th- the main thing I think we think about when we think about th- these different things about partiality or impartiality is that God meets everyone where they are. And he knows which people will be safe to save. Yeah. He, he knows people, people will be able to bring their character with them. Remember, that's the only that's thing that, that comes with them to heaven. That's it. And if, and if they are teachable, if they're teachable kind of people, humble, teachable kind of people, I believe they'll be safe in heaven. Mm-hmm. Well, and that gets down, you're absolutely right. He meets everyone where they're at, but he expects no one to stay where they're at. Yeah. Right? Because that's that part of being teachable. Yeah, yeah.
Okay. You know, um, verse 18 there in Deuteronomy 10, he defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and, lover, and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, for you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. Now, can, can, this be, can this be accomplished through legislation? No. Not really, I don't no. think, you know. Lo no, no, I don't think any kind of love can be accomplished through legislationary. Why but, is that? Because it's a matter of the heart. It's, That's right. Yeah. There's too many ulterior motives, aren't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. Well, if you have to have legislation, that would indicate it's not happening naturally <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right? otherwise you wouldn't need the legislation that's your choice right and so therefore it's, if it's imposed on you that 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 is saying saying exactly the opposite that it is not coming from the heart yeah you know it, it's it's the old thing like um you tell your sister that you love her yeah exactly <laughs> or you say you you're apologize sorry apologize right now you yeah. tell her you're sorry that's <laughs> yeah, right yeah. that's right <laughs> And then you're like, I'm sorry, then I'm not. Sabbath school expense. <laughs> yeah. You know. What about, okay, like on, on Tuesday's lesson. Let me ask you this. Can a, can a person who's dying of cancer be saved from cancer by another person dying from cancer and then having their death registered in the death registry as a credit to them? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> No. And yet, well, what about this? You know, can a person dying from cancer be saved from cancer by another person getting treatment and having the cancer go into remission and then having the medical records of the healed person placed into the record of the terminal person, and crediting them with the healing that the other person experienced? Doesn't quite work that way, does it? Doesn't work that way, does it? They'd call that like insurance fraud nowadays. <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yet, is, isn't this the same legal accounting of sin that has been perpetuated by the Roman church and picked up by a lot of Protestant churches mm. over the years? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Think, think about it. You know, mm. this uh, penal substitution. That's the theological name for it, you know. When it is taught, taught that acts of sin were punished in Jesus and salvation is the process of legally claiming his blood payment by faith so that we get his righteousness credited to us. If you really think this thing out logically, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, you know. And it, it has caused, I tell you what, you know, back... I've been in churches where this has been taught, you know, Adventist churches. And I just put it aside because I said, that's something I don't understand. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it just have to. What, otherwise, how, you know. How, how, how could it work like that? Because when you think about it, it, it if, you're claiming, if you're claiming, you know, legally Christ's blood by faith so that we get his righteousness credited to us, what does that do for our character? Well, you know, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about before, the, the ifs. He said, if you are the Son of God, do this. Well, this kind of is saying, if he died for your sins, then what's it matter what you do? Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's where you're getting at on this. If, if, if that's true, which is out of context in the same way that if you are the son of God, this will happen, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter how you live because he yeah, forgave what, yeah, it. Yeah, what does it matter what kind of person you are? Well, it absolutely is. It's, uh, these are all different forms of that. You know, now don't, don't get me wrong here. I don't, I don't think it's a sin to, to truly believe this. I think there'll be a number of people in heaven that believe in penal substitution, like I was saying before, you know? Mm -hmm. So n I never condemn anybody for, for, you know, truthfully believing something like this. Yeah. I mean, to me, sinfulness is a condition. You think about it. It's not, it's not a problem of legal standing. Yeah. It, it's a condition. 
because of Adam's sin that we're born with and we did not choose, you know, mm. we are born terminal. We are mm. born to die. Mm. Go ahead. So if sin is a legal problem in that there's a law and sin is a breaking of the law, you know what I mean? So there's a, it's a twofold thing. The thing that makes me delineate it the best is we have imputation and impartation. So imputation is when Christ puts us right with him. He gives it to us. It's a gift. Impartation is like salvation. It becomes part of us over time. We grow and modify our character like him when we follow him, and it becomes part of us. And so you can't talk about God's love without talking about law or legalism because his law is love. Well, well... Yeah, um, but Go ahead. you're absolutely right. And um, but Jesus' purpose on this earth and there is to be the healer. Right. Um, he showed that when the man was let down mm -hmm. through the rooftop. Yes. Everyone had an expectation that all he needed was his physical body healed. But Jesus said, I am the healer of the soul. And to prove that I am that... I will heal his body also. Um, but that is his, his greatest purpose is um, to be the healer of the soul. Yeah. Well, you know, I, and I said this when I was here last time, I, I think, you know, the Ten Commandments actually introduced a, a lot of the legal f way of thinking about salvation because and I think when God gave the Ten Commandments which was meeting the Israelites where they were you know they needed it but you see what it grew to I mean it, it got twisted didn't it well if, if, if it's because all about being a healer then the Ten Commandments are the diagnosis right so the law the benefit of the law it shows us of a need of our Savior right well, that's the yeah. diagnosis. That's the diagnosis, and it's God's character transcribed, she said. So the law of itself is not wrong. It just doesn't have the power to save us. And so there's a legal aspect. You can't have love without a standard, right? If I'm married, I've agreed to be faithful to my wife. There's a standard there. So we can't really have love without some kind of standard, and that's God's standard. Well, when we're outside of his standard, it tells us we need to run back to it. But, but weren't there a lot of people that didn't have the benefit of the commandments? You think about it, you know. And that's no different. It's his character, right? It's evident in creation. So it's not that the law is the thing that saves us. It's him and our following his principles. And just like we talked about, there's going to be people, Ellen G. White says there's going to be people in heaven that don't even know the name of Christ, but they're going to be there because they followed his principles to the best of the ability with the knowledge they had, and God covers the rest. Yeah. I mean, you think, think about, I mean, to me, it, it's this carnal condition that causes acts of sin in our lives. You know, this, this history, this lineage, you know, that comes down to us from Adam and Eve. You know, and our sins are the symptoms of our condition but not the cause. Think of, go ahead. I think about the law as a female when you get dressed, look at the mirror, how important that mirror is to you. And the mirror points out what you look like and what needs to be done over, fixed. So there's beauty in that law because with the law is the mirror. It points out and show me my sin. And I love that law because that law is what helps me to more like Christ and emulate what he wants me to be. So there's no hardship in the law once you understand. But we know the law does not save us. Right. So that's how I look at the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. That's that, yeah. That's that that's law of liberty, the, right? And that's, what, and that's what the Jews fell into, right? They fell into love with the law and what they were doing, but they totally lost the love of God. So it was without love that they were trying to follow the law, which is a mistake. Because God said, I 
brought you out of Egypt is the first part before the Ten Commandments. So if we're looking at what his expectation was, he'd already demonstrated love, and in response to his love, he hoped they would follow his commands or his law. Yeah. Yeah, but you're right. Um, all I, I'm saying, I mean, Ad, Adventists have fallen into this also. Some, a number of Adventists, a lot of them, you know. But it's just like, well, in last week was, and I think it was in our Sabbath school last week, right? So God took a complaint against them. Well, that was a, like a legal case, right? Right. Well, he didn't have to go to that until they had totally lost the relationship part of their relationship. The love part of their relationship, Israel had walked away and not done anything that he'd asked them to do. They were totally living outside of the law. That's when he went to the law to say, hey, I've got a complaint against you. You need to change your ways. And that was what he was hoping to do was to reveal to them, just like the mirror, you're outside of our relationship. Yeah. Well, let me... That's what it says when the Bible talks about the never kill it, but the spirit makes it alive, alive. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you this. Um... Is Christ the remedy for sin, for our sinful condition? What does that mean, Christ is the remedy? He's the healer. I was saying a minute ago. You said he's the healer. Yeah, because isn't that, you know, if you look at, if you look, actually look at the Greek word salvation in the New Testament, you know, one of the root meanings of it is healing. And, you know, that, I was trying to think which, which translation that was. You know, but there, there's, there's one translation of the New Testament that, you know, they're talking, Jesus is talking to the lepers, and the one leper specifically that came back, you know, yeah. and he says, your faith has healed and saved you. And that's the only translation I know. To me, that's the best translation I've read mm. because it brings out that healing meaning that's in that's in the Greek word that represents for salvation, you know, yeah. in the New Testament. Well, if you read Sal, 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 Sal. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does how does knowing Christ eradicate the carnal nature that's in us? How does that work? By beholding, we become changed. And what does it mean to behold in this? We have to follow him and spend time with him continually. To know, to know him. To know of his love, his great love for us, and to know what he has done. It's more than just yeah. a head knowledge, though. It's yeah. an experiential It's walk, doing, right? yes. It's doing, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that, that's what needs to be brought out. It's, it's doing the principles with God's help, with the Holy Spirit's help. We're not left out there to do it all by ourselves, you know, thank goodness. Yeah. But um, to do, to follow and practice the principles that God has laid out in Scripture for us. And that can actually start the healing process here on this earth. That's right. That, this is where heaven begins, Harry. This is where eternal life begins, right here. That's right, because you know how a bad habit makes an impression in our brains. And, and the more we do it, it, it gets stronger and stronger in our brains. Well, the same thing, a good habit does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, there is a possibility to experience some of, of what heaven will be like here on this earth if we follow God's principles and yes. practices. Yeah. And, and it's interesting what you know what you said about those those pathways in the brain, Harry. Yeah. The old paths still remain. They still remain, they're there. Yeah. But but the new habits uh, just override, you know, they override the old. Yeah, have you noticed that? That's why the hardest time to change it is the first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. When when you first try to change but after a while, with God's help, it becomes easier. Go. We used to sing this song, I remember, in the church as Adventists, turn your eyes upon Jesus. 
look full into his face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. The more we read and we come and want to be like him, and we pray and spend time, and we do spiritual search of our body, our souls, what we're doing, then we grow to be more like him each and every day. Yeah. So, I mean, we can't just say, well, I claim the blood of Jesus, you know, he's paid it all for me, and then I don't have to change. Well, I mean, and we've talked about this before. You're absolutely right. But, I mean, um, the entire purpose of the world and Satan is to promote selfishness. Yeah. Period. In one form or another. Selfishness is the core of, I, I believe, all sin. Yeah. It, um, it is what sin is made of. Yeah. yeah he, the, he, the rest of sin is just the outflowing of selfishness and different manifestations and satan knows rob that that it's selfishness that'll draw us away from god exactly and he's, and and he's right uh, he's absolutely right and, and that's that's how jesus heals is um when we get to know him and, and contemplate what he's done that breaks selfishness because it puts us in the right light of what love really is and love and selfishness cannot coexist. Yeah, we'll see. It, it is not possible. Right. You cannot have love and selfishness. You cannot have selfishness and no love. Yeah. And, and, and um, when you see the love that Jesus did in his sacrifice, the selfishness in you melts away. Yeah. How much time do we have left, guys? Two minutes. Two minutes? <laughs> okay. Just, just one other thing here. On, on Thursday's lesson, you know, is the, is the penalty for sin something God inflicts, or is, is it something that God holds back? What is the penalty for sin? Death. That's right. Yeah. It's death, isn't it? The ultimate penalty for sin is he turns us over to our will, right? Like if we continue Which, in it, like if it follows through to its completion, he allows us to go that way. Ultimate sin. Yeah. And, he, and he does. And then the ultimate end of that is eternal death, right? But, you know, but to show that God is impartial, I mean, in Ezekiel, it says that God will be watching the destruction of those who are lost on the, on the walls of the city of the New Jerusalem, and he will be crying. You think about it. Does God love anybody less because they're lost? No. I, I no, think and I, even in that strange act, yeah. Harry, he still loves. But he knows that, 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 that they would be miserable sure. in I th heaven. I think it still hurts him that Satan is lost. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. And in the opening of the great, listen to this, this is, um, from Ellen White, I'm going to close with this. In the opening of the great controversy, Satan had declared that the law of God should not, could not be obeyed. Listen to that. Could not be obeyed. That justice was inconsistent with mercy. And that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Every sin must meet its punishment, urged Satan. If God should remit the punishment of sin... He would not be a God of truth and justice, you know? I mean, so who is it that says every sin must be punished? Satan himself. Satan himself. Yeah. Satan himself. yeah. Which mean, is interesting. You notice that when Satan sinned in the heavenly courts, he didn't die. Or I think about this. I mean, how much brass did Satan have to sin in the very presence of God? Ooh. Man. If God was a God of punishment and destruction, I mean, Satan could have been history right then. Right then. Yeah. Right? And yet Satan was not afraid personally to sin in the very presence of God. And, and although I wouldn't recommend it, you could probably go outside this church and shake your fist at heaven and <laughs> probably nothing would happen. Let's see. This, this, is, this is the insidiousness of sin. Yeah. Satan's sin was not fully matured at that point either you, you see what i'm saying yeah 
rebellion and doubt are two different things. It starts with doubt. It starts with selfishness. It grows into rebellion, and the and the and the heart becomes harder and harder to where you might feel at the beginning like. And I think that Satan had some of this. I feel a little bit guilty for thinking this way, but then eh, I'm not going to think about that. You know, uh, I'm too good for that. You know, and then you come to God's presence. Well, maybe I should think twice about this. Well, maybe not. You know. Yeah. Um, it's insidious. It, it, it seems like not a big deal. It seems like I can handle it. And um, it grows and grows and grows. That's why if Satan would have just stood up beside God and said, pointed at God and said, he's a liar, the yeah. rest of heaven would have thrown him out. Yeah. But instead, it happened in a way that two-thirds of heaven was sympathetic with him. Have you wondered how long... Uh, Satan felt that way, how long he, these thoughts were in his mind, you know, to, to rebel. You know, you know, I think that there's some people that have a very wrong picture of God and Satan being one of them, yep. or the primary one, yep. but there are a lot of people on this earth who believe that great evil can only be held in check by great power. Yeah. yeah. I don't agree with that. Yeah, I don't either. No. I think, I think that it's the everyday small acts, the many small acts of kindness yep. and mercy. Yeah, you're right here. Those, those are the things that hold evil at bay. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that should be an encouragement to all of us. You may think that nobody sees what you do, but especially, you know, taken as a whole, if Christians would shed the light of God's character, of his mercy, of his love to other people in their community. And I challenge you that, especially this time of year when people are more in tune with that kind of thing, you know? Then I, th I think that evil is, held, that, that's what holds evil in check. Uh, I, let me read this quick quote. And it's talking about um, Satan. It said, coveting the honor which the Father had bestowed on his son, this prince of the angels aspired to power that it was the prerogative of Christ to alone to wield. A note of discord had now marred the celestial harmonies. The exaltation of self awakened forebodings of evil in the minds of whom God's glory was supreme. The heavenly councils pleaded with Lucifer. The Son of God presented before him the goodness and justice of the Creator and the sacred nature of his law. In departing from it, Lucifer would dishonor his Maker and bring ruin on himself, but the warning only aroused resistance. Lucifer allowed jealousy of Christ to prevail. It yeah. didn't happen in an instant. Yeah. Okay, let's bow our heads for prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the great privilege that it is to come here to your house on your day to study your word. Amen. Father, help that what we've said will be a good influence here today and also help that we'll go forth from this place and our lives be heavy with influence for the good because we've met you here today. Christ's name we ask it for his sake. Amen.